Well, I'm back. When we uh, last read, I finished up that sermon by John Calvin on the the value of the church, the uh, necessity, in fact, of, of the church and uh, Christians' attachment to a local body of Christians known as the church, one that's properly instituted, one that has uh, ordained ministers and the sacraments, faithful discipline that can only be carried out with a full complement of officers of the church, which God gave to the church. Uh, he outfitted the church, Ephesians 4 tells us, uh, and there's no other organization, institution that uh, compares to it or can replace it. Uh, having finished that, <coughs> I uh, thought I'd drop into a few sermons, uh, summer addresses, summer sermons by William Charles Robinson. I read uh, a sermon of Dr. Robinson, Dr. Robbie as he was called, uh, back a couple of months ago, and I had several comments concerning its uh, blessing to them. Uh, those people who commented, and so I thought I would, I would delve back into Dr. Robinson. For one reason, I just stated. Another is because Dr. Robbie uh, is the man uh, singularly most responsible for the PCA existing, even though he, he didn't, at the end of his life, he did not come into the PCA when the other churches and men did. Uh, but the reason I say he was singularly most responsible for it in this sense, that he was the, the theologian and the historical uh, theologian at Columbia Theological Seminary, which originated in Columbia, South Carolina, thus the name, but moved in uh, 1928 to Decatur, Georgia. It's been there since. It, um, it liberalized through the years. In fact, during the time of Dr. Robinson's tenure there, and he remained steadfast, a stout confessional Presbyterian, and um, was a, a, a great teacher and encourager to men like Frank Barker, who would start Briarwood Presbyterian Church and be a leader in the formation of the PCA in 1973. Uh, D. James Kennedy at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church Dr. Kennedy started that congregation and became a leader in the PCA. Uh, theologians like Morton Smith, um, who, who was the founding faculty member at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi, and then, of course, Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary in 1987. Also, for the first 15 years, the, the stated clerk, an important office in the government of Presbyterianism. He was the stated clerk for the first 15 years uh, from 1973 through 87. And so, uh, and the list goes on of men who studied with Dr. Robinson and then uh, became instrumental men in leading the churches out of the liberalized Presbyterian Church U.S., PCUS and uh, formation of the PCA. So he's an important figure in 20th century Presbyterianism here in America, but he was also a devoted man of the scriptures and a widely sought after preacher in churches around the country. So I thought sharing some of these would help. This is a collection of sermons that uh, that were delivered and then published under the title, The Certainties of the Gospel. The Certainties of the Gospel. And uh, we live at a time when, uh, just as in Dr. Robinson's time, uh, he, he, uh, he recognized that there was uh, a good deal of shaky ground when it came to what is the gospel and what's the mission of the church. Well, we live in a time like this now. These sermons were actually uh, first published in 1935, so he was a young man. Uh, he had just started teaching after earning his Ph.D. at Harvard University, just began his ministry teaching young men at Columbia. So here we are. 
Let's proceed with this. Faith is a certainty, declared Patrick Hamilton, the man whose martyr flames lit the Reformation fires in Scotland. A glorious sense of certainty was characteristic of the Protestant of the Reformation. God cannot be worshipped in doubt, cried Calvin and Cope as they publicly proclaimed the Protestant faith in France. To the end of his life, the Genevan insisted upon the necessity that, quote, we be assured of our salvation in order to invoke God as our Father in full liberty. Indeed, certitude was so distinctive of the Protestantism of the 16th century that the Council of Trent made a vigorous thrust at the empty confidence of the heretics. The Council of Trent was the what we call the counter-reformation, that is, the counter to the Protestant Reformation. It's, it's where Rome um, codified its heresies uh, for the world to, to know that indeed they are heretical. Uh, they anathematized, that is, they cursed, declaring outside the pale of, of Christianity uh, the doctrine of justification by grace through faith in Christ alone because they possess a works-oriented salvation. They, uh, they uh, anathematized those who did not hold to their seven sacraments, uh, which includes marriage, for instance. Uh, and so those who held to the two biblical sacraments, that being baptism and the Lord's Supper, rightly administered in both cases, uh, they anathematized, and on and on. Uh, their positions went. That's what the Council of Trent is all about. They met uh, uh, in the years just preceding Calvin's death in 1564. They concluded their work after four or five years in 1563. Let's continue reading. Indeed, Certitude was so distinctive of the Protestantism of the 16th century that the Council of Trent made a vigorous thrust at the empty confidence of the heretics. Following the tradition which began with Gregory the Great, Gregory was the first, as Protestants recognized, the first pope of a, of a genuine Roman Catholic Church. Now, of course, Rome claims all the way back to Peter but when you study early church history, the patristics, the fathers, you can't, you can't bear, you can't validate that. There's no way you can vindicate that kind of, that kind of claim, I should say, accusation on their part. Following the tradition which began with Gregory the Great, the Romanists left the veil of uncertainty hanging over the extent and the completeness of forgiveness. But Protestants gloried in the certainty of sins forgiven. When one compares much of current Protestantism with Romanism, he finds the 16th century roles almost reversed. A thoughtful surgeon once asked the writer why the Roman Catholic went under the knife with so much more assurance than the Protestant. In Neo-Protestantism, faith is characteristically described as a venture, a betting one's life that there is a God a decision made without adequate evidence by the naked power of an autonomous human will. Or, if one turns to the neo-Calvinist, Karl Barth's answer is too similar, at least in the feature of uncertainty. Barth's answer is too, or also similar. Faith, and here is a quote, Faith is a leap into the void, the agitated persistence in negation, or a walking on a knife edge between yawning chasms. One of the Protestants, or rather one of the writer's best students, contrasted the neo-Protestant and the historic Protestant doctrine of faith in a sermon entitled The Faith of a Gambler or The Faith of a Saint. A progressive transference of the gospel emphasis 
from God to man has brought about this loss of certitude. Why don't you listen to that again? Because what he's saying is that by the time that the Reformation was just waning, and certainly in the early part of the 20th century when he's writing, that uh, faith was no longer something certain. Faith was a leap, as it were, into the void. So it was, I hope so, but not in the biblical hope sense. He continues, A progressive transference of the gospel emphasis from God to man has brought about this loss of certitude. A man-centered salvation, a man-centered soteriology. Anytime it depends on man, you can bet there will be a lack of certainty. But when salvation depends on God, he is the same, he is dependable, he is immutable, he's unchanging. We know that when he does something, it's complete. As he, as he tells us in Philippians, that those, that which he has started, that which he begun in us, he will bring to completion in Christ Jesus. That doesn't sound like a, well, I hope so, or, well, I can't be sure, but. And the reason is because Paul was writing from the perspective of God does this wonderful thing for us, not man cooperates with God in this wonderful thing that God would like to do for us. Man is ephemeral transient, variable, relative, uncertain, multitudinous. God is one, eternal, true, changeless, certain. The lost chord in modern Protestantism can be restored only by a new recognition of God's true relationship to the gospel and the gospel way of salvation. The pressure of opposition and persecution helped drive the reformers back upon God. There must be a return to God before there can be a return of certainty. Divine attestation must replace human autonomy. Instead of a progressive glorification of man, there must come a progressive or a cataclysmic return to the reformed slogan, Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be glory. Apostle the Apostle has placed a series of stepping stones to the goal of this lost certainty. At each of the focal points in the Gospel, Paul has erected not an I think, not an I hope, not an I wager, but an I know. These certifications present God with his certainty as the key to the present need, the apostolic apologia, or apology, is to lead to be baousis, the direct certitude of the gospel. All stepping stones mark the way Protestantism must travel if she is to recover her lost sense of certainty. Well, if you have friends who struggle with their assurance and the certainty of the gospel, you need to hear these sermons. Better yet, you need to read them all. I probably won't read the entire book. There are several sermons and addresses published here, but I'll read just enough for us to have a good foundation. Perhaps some of you struggle with it because you've put too much emphasis on what you do, what you believe, instead of who Christ is and what he's accomplished and what the Holy Spirit is doing. Again, these will be wonderful in helping you move from I think, I hope, I wager, to I know. Paul's not the only one that teaches the I know. John did in 1 John 5. He says, I've written these things so that you may know, and it's the knowledge of certainty, that you may know certainly that you have eternal life.